Today we're going to talk about the surface preparation for tile and stone, floor preparation. How come it's so important? Sir, like when you eat off of your plate, did you wash that plate before? Is it cleaned? So you prep the plate, you clean the old food off, you got rid of the old off of there, and now you're going to go ahead and put some new food on your plate. So you surface prep that. Have you ever painted a car before or tried to paint a car before? You understand how much sanding and cleaning and cleaning and cleaning there is before you paint. You're only as good as what you're stuck to. If I have a substrate, I have a layer of dust, and then I put any type of epoxy, a mortar, cement mortar, adhesive on top of it, I'm going to stick to the layer of dust. We have an inside joke in technical services. The best surface prep tool is doing it wrong the first time because it lifts all of that stuff up off the floor. And the second time works great because it's not in any of these pores. The other thing, and guys, you might need to look at you towards your wife or girlfriend about this. You need to open the pores up. We're gonna to need to exfoliate like we do on our face to keep them clean. If you've got blocked pores, I need that porosity opened up so water can get pulled down in there and drag the cement particle with it or drag the glue down in there with it. This is very important. <sighs> Look at that. Look at that. What do you do when you show up on a job like that? Hopefully not close your eyes. So there's a couple of things going on here. First thing that would concern me is all of that cracking on the surface. I doubt that that cracking is all the way through the concrete because if it is, you need to gently back off of that job and run. But there is, this, this is a slab that is not ready for you to install anything on top of it. Then you have these spots where it's blistered and come up to the top. You're going to have to address this a couple of different ways. First thing is you're going to have to figure out why it's cracked. And then you can address that. Next thing is you're going to have to go ahead and patch those spots. We have the product for that. First step in surface prep. I see it. I can't say it enough. Back in the old day, back when I installed, we didn't have vac systems that worked this well. But now you guys have vacuums with just one caveat and one caveat only. You've got to make sure that the filter on that vacuum is clean. Come on, I have walked on jobs with guys vacuuming and draw, drawing up dirt and dust through the vac system only to spread it evenly behind it as it's blowing out of the filter because it's clogged. Clean filter. Clean the filter. One more time, clean the filter. A clean filter will help you get a clean floor. Now that I've vacuumed the floor, I can see what's going on. I can see the dust. I can see all of those things on there. Clean the filter. One more time, just in case you guys didn't hear me the first four times. This is what I'm talking about, about porosity. If the pores or the substrate that you're going on top of, if water does not penetrate down and draw into the slab like it does on the right, if it does what it's doing on the left and it beads up, you got a problem. This problem could be just sitting on the surface. This problem could be just below the surface. This problem could be all the way through. You will not know until you start and make an attempt at grinding or scratching that surface. A really quick test that I used to do is that if I showed up on a job site, I poured water on the slab and it beat it up like it did over here on the left, I would just take a screwdriver, scratch the slab, and pour water on top of the scratch. If it penetrates down into the scratch, this is topical. This is something just sitting on the surface. It could be removed as easily as maybe just with a buffer. Um, if it's in a little bit, you might have to get a little bit more aggressive and go with a grinder. But if it's integral, if it's built all the way into the concrete structure, now we have, you might have to pick the phone up and change your plans on how you're going to bond to this substrate. So this is a great test right here to find out. This is the first thing you should do. You as an installer are the last line of defense here. You are the last line of quality control in this whole thing. If you start installing on that slab, that means you've accepted the conditions of that slab. And at that, that's not good. Look, we have 3D CAD drawings that are going to help you bond to plywood substrates or concrete substrates. The world's not all concrete substrates. 
all right? As me growing up in the business, it was highly frowned upon to put ceramic tile on plywood substrates until we learned how. So make sure you pick that phone up, you call your local MAPE rep, they'll guide you through, they'll send you these CAD drawings, and they will assist you in making sure that you have the right product choices for the right system to ensure that your install works. By the way, we're not just talking about floors. What, people don't put tile on walls? Have you not looked in a design magazine lately? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely, we are talking about floors and walls. We are correcting, flattening, and straightening floors and walls. By the way, I kind of really like this picture because if you look carefully and you see what the guy is doing, that looks like somebody used the five blob method, put tile up on a wall, and now it fell down because um, I can see the efflorescence dripping down on the left-hand side there, and now he's going to grind the wall flat and they're going to start all over again. Don't do that, by the way, please. Use the proper mortar and use the proper technique. The TCNA puts out a handbook every two years. In that handbook is every known method that works in there on how to do it. We connect our 3D CAD drawings based on the methodology that they use and we substitute our products in for the recommendations. Pick up the phone or go on our website and check it out. You'll find out the exact system that you need to do to ensure that you get proper surface prep. Now, biggest thing that we show up on a job site, you look at that slab, you can see where he hasn't gone over the slab with the machine, and you can see where it's shiny. That tells me there's some sort of wax or something on that surface that's probably blocking those pores and is going to prevent you from bonding to it. It can be as simple as hitting it with a grinder or hitting it with some sort of buffer and some sandpaper or some sort of abrasive or some sort of um, device on the buffer that's going to go ahead and break the surface loose. It can get as complicated as stepping it up a notch and now we're starting to grind that top surface off. Notice here, by the way, they're using a vac system. If I don't put that dust in the air and I can trap that dust now, that's less dust that I have to vacuum off the slab later on. However, it can get as sophisticated as sh shop blasting is required. Shop blasting is kind of aggressive, but it takes off that top 16th inch layer um, and creates surface profile. Now, when I get a little bit of texture on a floor, shortest distance between two points, anybody? Anybody? I heard you. Is a straight line. You are correct. It's you, man. You're smart. Um, is a straight line. If I'm putting texture on a floor in a one foot area, I might have one foot as the crow flies, but because I got to go up and down these little miniature mountains and valleys, I might have a foot and an inch. I have more surface area, which is going to increase my bond strengths because I have more area that I'm bonding to than what's on the surface. Does that make sense? Sometimes smooth isn't always the best thing, especially with this. This is a great opportunity. Understand surface profile. And you're going to see on packaging. By the way, did I not tell you to read the packaging? Yeah, you need to read the packaging. I don't care how smart you think you are, and I don't care how many years you've been doing this. You need to read the packaging because as manufacturers are required to make adjustments for all kinds of issues, product issues or environmental issues, they'll make those corrections and post them on their packaging. And so what you the way that you used to use a product might not be the way that you use it now. It might require a little more water. It might require a little less water. It might require it, and guess where that's located at? On the packaging. So pick up, read the packaging, pick the phone up, call your rep, or talk to your tech rep. This is pretty traumatic. This right here is scarifying. Now, scarifying is basically just blasting rows in there, just taking an eighth of an inch, three sixteenths of an inch of material from the surface down. If I have extreme, extreme contamination or really, really ugly floors, or in a lot of cases in remodels in a lot of older buildings, when they remove interior walls, so this part of the building for years had cut back on the floor in vinyl, it was the inside office area, and this part out here was the warehouse, had nothing on the floor, but it's got grease and grime and, and 20, 30, 40 years of all of that being ground into the floor from forklifts driving on it, and now we tear the wall out that 
divides the two and we're going to make this one giant room in order for me to tie that floor together so it's monolithic i might need to go ahead and scarify it like this and blast out a whole eighth inch three sixteenths of an inch of material and then come back with the shot blaster and clean up that that mess a little bit and try to minimize it remember we talked about surface profile well, also the type of equipment that you use will create surface profile. So if you look on your left where it says grinding, it's kind of like a, your sidewalk, a real pretty sidewalk, but there's still some porosity and pores in there. And it's all about maintaining the porosity and pores of the system. The next one is shot blasting. Shot blasting gets a little more aggressive. And the third one is scarifying. You can see it's just like taking a giant garden rake and just raking it out of there. It's not the prettiest, but if I'm going to put ceramic tile on top of this, sometimes I don't need the prettiest. I need a flat floor, maybe with some grooves and edges in it. I'm okay with that. So just think about the, the situation where you're at. If I'm doing a train station, if I'm doing an airport, I'm doing a shopping mall where I'm just getting a whole bunch of traffic all day long, and then at night, I might actually be getting cars and vehicles driving on top of it or forklifts or all kinds of things. I want to really have a really aggressive surface profile. These are surface profile chips. I alluded to it a little bit earlier. Understanding the profile that's required will help you with your bonding. So if you look at one, two, and three, that's pretty much where we're at. And you're looking at basically versions of your sidewalk, a newer sidewalk, an older sidewalk, but basically flat with a little bit of texture on it. When we get into four, five, and six, now we're getting a little more, we're getting a little rougher, more like what I would equate a driveway with. So especially one that's on an angle, something that I have to have a little bit of grip or grit to. So if it's wet or if there's snow, my car is not going to slide down the hill. When we go into seven, eight, nine, and 10, think about bridge repair. You see these guys all the time. You see the bridges, they've got the net underneath them, they've got it blocked off, you got a guy with a chip and hammer out there, and they're trying to create this really, really, really deep profile so they can repair that with a mortar and ensure that they get the best possible bond. So, if you check the packaging, it'll tell you the surface profile required. Once again, read the instructions. By the way, you do know our instructions come in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and then we put little man pictures on the back so because you guys aren't going to read any of those other languages, but you will look at the pictures. So please look at the pictures and find out the information that you need. Like, how long do I mix it? Like, how much water do I mix it with? No freestyling. Read the packaging, follow the instructions. So let's talk about mud bed and repair products. Um, this picture right here, I can't tell you how many times I have gone to job sites, I bid the job, I've gone to the job site two weeks before we're supposed to start the job, the job looks good, all systems are a go, you bring your crew two weeks from now, we're going to be good to go. And we show up and there's a trench running through an area that we're supposed to put floors in that wasn't trenched two weeks ago. So now what are we supposed to do? Technically, if you fill that up with standard cement, you're supposed to wait 28 days. Ah, eh, I don't have 28 days. Most jobs don't have 28 days, especially when you're approaching the, on a job site, putting in the floors. It means you're at the back end of the job, not on the front end of the job. And there's already been days lost in the process. So we make mud bed repair products that can fill that trench and, and you don't need to wait 28 days for it to cure and dry. You need to wait three days for it to cure and dry, which is a huge difference. First thing I'm going to talk about is Mopachim Premixed. It's a fast setting screed mortar for concrete repairs and subfloor preparation work. Um, allows setting in three to four hours. It also allows floor covering in 16 to 18 hours. So if I'm putting down vinyl sheet goods on top, if I'm putting down um, a rubber floor on top, anything like that where it might be a moisture sensitive product, I have to wait 16 to 18 hours. That's basically a day. I put it in today at two, I wait till tomorrow at two, and I can jump on top of it. Otherwise, I'm looking at three to four hours. It goes from a quarter of an inch to four inches. That's, that is ginormous. Most slabs are four inches, so if they trench all the way down to the bottom by putting this product in there, you're going to be good to go in a couple hours. 
Next one is Top Gym Premix. Goes from a quarter inch to two inches. So you can see the Top Gym. So this is more of a deep fill all the way through product, Mopper Gym Premix and Top Gym, hence the name Top Gym. Um, Premix is a topical. Goes from a quarter to two inches, same standards. Um, can go up to four inches when it is extended with aggregate. But why do that when I can just purchase the other product? Um, these products are, are, are great for just going ahead and filling in deep gaps and stuff like that. I know there's a thing called self-leveler and we're going to discuss that, but if I got to go ahead and fill two, three inches with self-leveler, that can get kind of pricey. A way I can control that price is to fill these deep voids and some of these deeper holes with a product like this, screed across it, and then come in and pour the leveler on top of that to smooth it off and give me that final finished monolithic layer all the way across that I can go ahead and install on top of. And I know a lot of you guys think, well, why are we even talking about surface prep and smooth and flat? You know, we're doing ceramic tile. Those days are over with. Let me explain to you why. Is anybody even shocked anymore when you see a three foot by three foot tile? I can help you out with that. No. A three foot by three foot tile and put a BB in the middle of that tile and stand on that tile, it'll break. I, if you have a three foot by three foot tile, if you have large thin panel gauge porcelain tiles on walls or on floors, I need flat. You see, when I have a, a 12 by 12 sheet of one inch by one inch mosaic glass tile, I can, it'll conform to all the little whoopties and undulations and stuff like that. But when I have those whoopties and undulations and I have a large format tile sitting on top, at some points I'm resting on the mountain peaks and at other points I've got a valley inside of there. With me, if I stood on top of that and it wasn't supported properly, I didn't have the right amount of mortar in there, I could crack and break that tile. This could be a huge issue. Or I could exceed the depth that the mortar's going to work. That's a huge issue, a huge issue. So what's important? is do your surface prep up front, especially with these larger tiles. And one more thing, it's a little off topic, but I need to say it out loud and I'm gonna say it often going forward. We need to rethink about how we're grouting three foot by three foot tiles with 16th inch grout joints. It doesn't make any sense to me at all to spread grout completely over a three foot by three foot tile so I can fill a 16th or an eighth inch grout joint just to have to go ahead and put a three foot by three foot worth of water to clean the top of that tile, that's all gonna go into that little tiny grout joint and flood it out. Think about it, guys. Mapalath is a synthetic lath. It's hard to say synthetic lath. It's a synthetic lath that's lightweight. If you've ever carried expanded metal lath on, on your shoulder and didn't get cut, good for you. Um, Mapalath is plastic and synthetic, comes in a roll. I can carry it on my shoulder. I not get cut. I'm not going to scratch the wall. I'm not going to damage anything in the room. You put it down, you slap staple it down on top of your, your, wood, your approved wood substrate, and then I can pour self-leveler right on top of it, and I'm good to go. This slide is courtesy of my friends at the IMI, and I appreciate it because it shows the complete breakdown. It shows the system. Guys, you need to use these 3D CAD drawings to your advantage going forward. You should have a copy of them. You should have a book or a little binder or something that has these pictures in there. So when you're looking at a scenario, you can go, why don't we do this and show the picture with all the layering. That way you can cut through the red tape, you can cut through all the phone calls waiting for people to call you back. You can have the answers right in front of you by having these types of 3D CAD drawings. This is another one showing a system on top of a slab. It's just a slab, it's just mortar, and it's just tile. It's extremely simple system. Here's one here that's on plywood, understanding the spacing on plywood. Then going ahead and, and putting down a wire mesh or a mop lath on top, putting down an, a mud bed on top of that, mortar on top of that with waterproof membrane, and your tile on top. You want to protect the system. Waterproof membranes, especially with wood subfloors, are very important when it comes to ceramic because we tend to get it's ceramic. It can get wet and that's fine, but if water starts penetrating down through that system, there is nothing going to stop the water. Eventually it'll work its way down beneath the tile 
and beneath your, your, your mortar bed and now start attacking your wood subfloor. You don't want that to happen. Waterproofing is the way to prevent that from happening. Look, I want to discuss something with you. Here in the United States, we do, we do a lot of mud repair work, but it seems to be a lost and dying art. And as a friend of mine said, you knew you made it in the tile business when you could do mud work and somebody had that reputation. That's when you kind of achieved that level of, I'm a mechanic, I can do this. Um, in Europe, they do a lot more of this than we do here in the United States. They do a lot of unbonded mortar bed systems and mud systems over there in Europe. And for that, we'll start with the simplest of those render mortars, which is a four to one mud bed mix, four parts sand, one part cement, it's very simple. Why is, why is this important? Well, if you think back into the 80s and years ago, literally we used to have a pile of sand brought to the job site, a high rise building or whatever, and we would have bags of cement and there would be a guy with a shovel putting in four shovels of sand and one shovel of cement and then adding a little bit water and chopping the mud up in, into the bucket and then it would be brought to us inside. Well, that can be, for, let's just start from an environmental standpoint. Having a big pile of sand sitting out front on a job as the wind's blowing it around, it's not the most efficient way of doing this. Number two, it took up space. More importantly, environmentally, it's not very safe to have that sand blowing around. And you lose quality control, you lose consistency. If the guy has a bad moment and puts five bags of sand or five shovels of sand or three shovels of sand instead of, instead of four, um, there could be, it, it, it definitely could impact the floor. You wouldn't get that consistency. Architects, engineers, designers, builders, they all started liking having a pre-mixed bag mix. So four to one mud bed mix is that. I can now stack these bags in the building, on site, in the spot, controlling the temperature of that and ensuring that every time if I mix it with the same amount of water, I'm going to get the, the same performance out of that product when I mix it. This goes up from 3 eighths of an inch to 3 inches um, and it can be mixed with Planacrete AC for a little bit more flexibility and strength. Next one, modified mortar bed. So now let's talk about showers, shall we? A modified mortar bed is basically like the 4 to 1 mud bed mix, a little more sophisticated. The sand is not quite as rough and coarse and it's modified, which means it has latex and acrylic in there and so I get flexibility. And why is that important? Well, I'm just gonna use Sam Shower as an example. In my house, normally in South Florida in the summertime, which is right now for us, um, I'm keeping my temperature in the daytime around 73, 74 degrees. But if I went home and decided to take a shower, my shower tile is gonna go from 73 to 74 degrees to 105 degrees in about two minutes. That's a lot of flexing and movement and that tile pulls on the substrate down below what it's bonded to, which would be a mud bed in this case. So think about that, especially when you're in wet areas or showers or places like that, a modified mortar bed is perfect because it has the flexibility built right into it. Plan a slope RS is a rapid setting screed float that can go from a quarter inch to three inches. Now, when I say rapid setting, I'm talking about an hour and a half, I can put tile on top of this. Um, it, can be, it can be applied up to five inches in, in, for uses in trenches where it's confined on the sides. Um, it's just, this is, this is next generation. And a lot of times people say, How, why do you guys have so many products? Every year, new opportunities come along. Every year, there are new regulations, there are new standards, there's new tile, there's new methods, there's new every year. It, and so you gotta stay on the cutting edge and it helps drive the business. Um, it helps drive the, the flooring business. By having rapid setting, something we never had before, I don't have to wait the traditional 24 hours, 48 hours, in some cases 72 hours or longer for that mud bed to cure out and dry out before I put my ceramic tile on top or my porcelain tile on top. Now, in a couple hours, I can get on top of it. Now, what you're gonna see here is you see Mike, that's, I know that's Mike, because he's a friend of mine. He's rendering a wall. And again, I cannot tell you how important it is to not forget about walls. Wall rendering 
is really important, especially if I'm putting glass tile or something in a shower on that wall. Yeah, it could absorb the movement, but do you want that look? Your customer did not pay you to see that ugliness on a wall, okay? And so you need to understand that you're gonna to need to render that wall and get it flat. And that's what Mike's doing here. He found a low spot or a dip in the wall and he went ahead and put the mud up on the wall. Now he's screeding up on it. And the product that we're using for that is Planet Top 330 Fast. Quick setting, fiber reinforced, cementitious rendering mortar. And you're like, what? Yeah. So remember how we had the RS before, the rapid setting mud bed? Now we've got it for the wall. We've got a rapid setting system waiting for you. You put that on the wall, you screed it on. This, you're gonna love the way this product feels. Um, we took guys or people that specifically worked and did mud work, brought them in for about a week, and we worked on the formula so it felt good to them because sometimes guys can be picky about how their mortars feel. So. Planet Top 330 Fast can go from an eighth of an inch to an inch and a quarter. If your wall's out more than an inch and a quarter, you got bigger issues than, than a crooked wall. Um, it smooths out really easy and it sticks to the wall. Um, Non-sagging in 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, this is a great product. Uh, this is absolutely the product designed to fix the walls in the shower or in the large wet areas that you're doing. I recently, um, was looking at remodeling my bathroom and one of the concepts that my wife brought up to me, of course she showed me in a magazine, was a wet room where basically there's no distinction between the shower and the rest of the room. Water just magically flows into a drain somehow. Um, I'm looking into that, but what I realize is I'm probably gonna go, have to go ahead and put backer board completely in my bathroom and render those walls and fix them with Planet Top 330 Fast. I can't tell you how many hours I spent on floors doing just that right there. Uh, I miss those days. So, patching and skim coats, plan a prep MRS. You're like, dude, it's just another skim coat. Well, do you know what the M stands for in MRS? Moisture resistant skim coating. Now, we're gonna have a conversation about moisture. Water comes in three forms, a liquid, a solid, and a gas, okay? In a gas, that's the vapor. So a really quick example, go into your bathroom, turn the hot water on, the hot water in the liquid form comes out, but now it starts to separate off because it's lighter than air and the molecules float in the air. And it's like a fog or that steam or that mist, that's a gas. That gas is rising up. Well, it's also the same thing happens inside of your concrete slabs. So you might have moisture in, inside of the concrete slab. And now I'm gonna cover it with three foot by three foot porcelain tile. Is porcelain impervious? The reason we like porcelain is because nothing penetrates through it. And that includes from the bottom up. So if I'm putting three foot by three foot porcelain tile with the tiniest grout joints I can legally get away with within the industry, I'm not giving that vapor anywhere to escape. So now we're gonna to have to go to battle with it. It would rise up and then sit between the tile and the substrate. If you're using the wrong patch that can't handle that, that patch will eventually start to break down. Planta Prep MRS is designed high moisture resistant. It's designed for that scenario. I don't wanna say it's an exterior grade skim coat. I, I, I don't wanna tell you to use it outside, but it's basically an exterior grade skim coat is what it is. So understand where you're using, what you're using, and the scenario, and make sure you pick the right product. And then Mopachim Quick Patch. I mean, it's a little story about this. This product was initially designed to fill deep holes before you poured self-leveler. And then we did something crazy. We put it in the hands of installers. And now it does just about everything. Installers love this product. It can go from a sixteenth of an inch to an inch and a half can go from an inch and a half to three inches in confined areas where I break them off. So if I'm gonna ramp, I can go from a 16th of an inch to three inches on a ramp, and about every 24 feet, I'm gonna have to break the continuation of the product so it can expand and contract with all of that and not crack. 
This could be used interior, exterior. This is the product you need to have in your car. It can fix in basements. It can handle ramps from like when you close in a garage or when you close in another room and you have that elevation difference. This can be the first product for that. And it's called Mopassum Quick Patch. Do you know what the quick stands for? It's fast. This is the product you want to use if your time is of the essence and I've got to fill deep holes. Mopassum Quick Patch. This product, one of my favorites, I love this product. This is EcoPrim Grip. I can remember when this product first came out. We predicted we were going to sell so many units within a year. Within one trade show presentation, we sold 75% of all inventory that we predicted for the year within a 15 minute moment. Once somebody figured out that I don't need this to grind tile, I don't need to chip the tile up, I can go tile over tile. Once the person realized that in a commercial level, in an institutional level, in a residential level, once the person realized I don't need to tear the tile up, make all that mess and generate all that waste, just roll this product on, it changed everything. This changed the business. This product right here changed the business. Echo Prim Grip. I can use it for self leveler. I can use it for a primer before I go ahead and put something down. I can use it, I can use it in an application where I'm just going to go tile over tile, like in a bathroom or maybe in your whole house. You know, the first thing, if I am going to go tile over tile in any scenario, here's the one thing I need to understand. Do my doors, my exterior doors swing out or swing in? So, I live in a hurricane zone. Anytime you live in a hurricane zone, your doors swing out so the hurricane can't blow your doors in. But if you live in a zone where there could be snow, your doors better swing in, otherwise you're not getting out of your house if snow piles up against the door. And I bring this point up because if I change the elevation in my house, it's not a big issue. I don't have to mess with the front door. I don't have to cut the doors. I don't have to cut any of my exterior doors. But if I'm up north or I'm in a place where the doors swing in, then I have to understand how high I'm, I'm, I'm picking this floor up and I'm probably going to have to cut the bottom of the door so they can swing in. So that's the first thing you want to take into consideration. Do my doors swing out or do my doors swing in? If they swing out and or you're not afraid to cut the doors, your exterior doors, Echoprim grips the product for you. Primers for self-levelers, Primer X. Primer X was specifically designed for, and it's a lot like Echo Prim Grip, but it was designed for if there's an epoxy system down on the floor, a moisture system, Primer X is the product just for that. Dries quickly in one to two hours, and depending upon the circumstances and in conditions, um, it's 100% solids, it bonds to epoxy really, really well. That's its mission in life. Um, is low VOCs. Primer X, if you have a moisture barrier down and now I'm going to go ahead and pour product on top. And then primer for self levelers, this is Primer T. Now if you notice, Primer T used to be clear, milky and then dry clear. We changed it to the color of, I just learned this color so I'm very proud of myself, magenta. That's what color it looks. And the reason we did that was when you're priming a floor before you pour self leveler, it is so important for you to understand that you want to go ahead and, and prime the whole thing and not have a gap. Again, I told you always before I needed porosity in the floors if I'm going to bond to them. Whether they're plywood, whether, whatever, whatever surface they are, wood or cement, I need porosity. I need the water to get pulled down and then I need the product to get pulled down into those pores with the water. With a self leveler, I'm going to kind of block that porosity with the primer. And the primer is going to marry and mate with the self leveler poured on top. So now the primer is going to pull down into the pores and grab a hold and, and lock on there. And it, before the primer completely dries, this is why you need to read the instructions once again and understand that this primer has an open time. You can't put primer down on Monday and come back three weeks later and expect to be able to pour leveler on top. Not good. Read the instructions and understand the time frames. 
then the primer, the mortar will go ahead and bond, or the self-leveler will go ahead and bond to that primer when it's within its open window. All right, so let's talk about self-levelers. First thing that has to happen, all self-levelers need to be primed. We make a plethora of primers and we make a plethora of self-levelers. Pick that phone up, call your sales rep, and find out what combination works best for your job. For this demonstration, we're going to be using primer T. Now, first thing I want you to notice is this is a roller. It's a 3 8 inch snap roller. And for this presentation, this is going to be called the hard side. This is the soft side of the roller. I know you've never thought about that before, but it makes a difference, and you'll see why. You want to load the roller up. Please, 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 make sure you use a pan. Pour it. The, the primer in the pan and use the roller with the pan. These pans are throwaways. They're pennies. They cost pennies. Um, I've seen too many job failures where guys have poured it onto the floor and then went ahead and tried to roll it out. And it was way thicker where they poured it than where they rolled it out and it creates, it can create a failure. So just use a pan. Next thing, you want to roll towards the hard side. And I'll show you why in a minute. As you're rolling the floor, you don't really, you let the roller do the work. You don't want to put any pressure on it. If you've got to start squeezing out material, you need to get more material on your roller. Now here's what happens. When I roll to the soft side of the roller, I wind up leaving what I like to call W's. The thing is that, that there's twice, three times, four times as much product on those W's where it overlaps. So guess how much longer it's going to take to dry? Two, three, four times longer it's going to take to dry right there. And you're wasting product. By rolling on this side, I'm basically feathering out and I'm getting rid of those W's. I'm making sure that I have a thin monolithic layer. I know that's a big word for me a thin monolithic layer of material that's going to dry evenly okay primers primer L has been around for a minute now one of the things I like about this product is that bucket that you see right there that's not the product you put on the floor. You mix it with water, three to one. So if I have a gallon of Primer L, I make four gallons of product. And this is the only product I'm going to tell you that we make, that I want you to put it on with a broom. The reason is it's so thin, it's so watery-like that it'll fall into the deep valleys and roll off the tops of the high spots and you might not get the area properly primed. So I want to broom it until I see it penetrate into all the areas. I want to use a broom. I can put it down with a, with a roller, but I want you to agitate it with a broom to make sure that it's reaching all the nooks and crannies that are out there. Okay, Primer L. Low odor, low VOCs, that's so important these days with sustainability and everything. That's very, very important. Make sure you check those. Another primer for self-leveler is Primer We or Primer WE. I like this product. It's a two-part water-based epoxy. And what I mean by that is it's part A and part B. It's a cup, a cup, a gallon, a gallon, a teaspoon, a teaspoon of part A and part B. I don't have to mix the whole unit together. And when it's ready for you to pour self-leveler on top of it, if you walked on it, it would probably rip the shoes right off the bottom of your feet. I like how sticky this product is. Um, there's no mistaking whether it's ready or not. It'll let you know when it's ready. Primer E, E stands for epoxy. Some places, some areas require this. Like, dude, where am I going to use an, a primer, what, an epoxy primer? Well, I got news for you. Um, over metal? Well, where's metal? Hospital rooms, elevator cabs, cruise ships. Just stop me. Just stop me anytime you want. Areas like that where moisture resistance and water resistance are key 
and uh, they are difficult to bond to surfaces. Primer E is that product. Now you got two options when you use an epoxy. Option one is you roll the epoxy out and literally right behind you they're pouring the leveler into the wet epoxy. But once the epoxy starts to set up and flash off, then you're done. So they go to option two. You roll the epoxy on the floor and while it's still wet, you broadcast sand into it. A large chunky piece of sand, by the way. You broadcast sand into it on two rejection, which that means is I should be able to stand on top of the sand that I threw in that epoxy and no epoxy gets on the bottom of my shoes. Then you come back the next day and sweep off all the sand that the epoxy didn't grab and then you pour your leveler on top of that. And that leveler finds all those little nooks and crannies and caves that that sand made and wraps itself around there and locks on and bonds it. All right, let's talk about a different form of surface prep, self-levelers. Self-levelers have been around for quite a minute on the floor covering side. Soft goods, carpeting, hardwood, vinyl. They've been using self-levelers for years and years. Well now, as tiles have gotten larger, it's become very, very advantageous for us to use self-levelers on this side of the fence, on the hard surface, on marble, on granite, and on large format tile and stone. Because again, the flatter that floor is, the easier your install goes. Using self-levelers makes that happen quickly with minimal labor, and you get a great result. Now, the one thing I need to caution you about self-levelers, there is no freestyling when it comes to mixing. If it calls for six quarts of water, that's how much water you mix it with. By the way, there's 128 ounces in a gallon of water. So if you don't have a proper measuring pitcher, you have something that can at least measure the ounces. Do the math and make sure you're putting the proper amount of water in the self-leveler when you mix it. If you overmix the self-leveler, it can totally create a problem. Over here to my right, this is self-leveled that's mixed completely the right way. It's mixed with the proper amount of water. And you can see it's a nice uniform color. It has dense, it's solid. This is a self-leveler mixed with 5% too much water. And you can see you're getting this white film on top. You can see parts of it that are solid, but you can also see parts of it where it's separated and it's creating a problem here. And this is mixed with 10% too much water. This is what happens. You've ruined the structural integrity of that self-leveler. Now your floor is dependent upon bonding to that. That's going to be a problem. This is what you want, not this or this. Read the instructions. My instructions come in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and man pictures. I'm sure you speak one of those. All right, let's talk about self-leveling underlayments. We have a plethora of them, and I want to make sure I give all of them enough love so you understand the differences. So in this group, this is kind of what I like to call my legacy collection. These products have been around a while, they've performed for a while, and they're really, really, really good products. Um, we're going to start with the double secret code. If it begins with Novo, it's normal setting. If it begins with Ultra, it's rapid setting. So normal setting means 24 hours, I have to wait for it to be poured before I can set ceramic tile, porcelain tile, glass tile on top of it. If, I, if it's Ultra, I wait three hours. For floor covering with Novo, I wait three days. For floor covering with Ultra, I wait 24 hours. So it's a matter of how much time do you have in the job? How big is it? Is there other things you can do? Uh, of course, there's going to be a price difference in between there. We're not getting into that here. Um, but I do want you to understand that there is a difference. The next thing then is how deep the product can go. So we're going to start with Planetex SLF, which is our only gypsum-based product that we have. And the reason we have that is a lot of places already have gypsum down on the floor. I want to go over top of this, cap it off, put a nice little fresh cap on top of there, make it nice and smooth. This is the product for that. Next one is Novo Plan 2. Remember, it begins with Novo. So is it normal or rapid? That's right. I heard you. Normal. 
Noble Plan Easy is the next one. Noble Plan Easy means that it's low prep. I don't have to shot blast the floor. I just have to use Echo Prim Grip or a Primer T or something to that effect of that type of primer on the floor before I pour this on there. Next one is Ultra Plan Plus. Ultra Plan, rapid setting, right? And then Ultra Plan Easy. Again, I've got the easy on the back end, which means it's low prep. Now, when I say this, the ones that don't have the easy on the ends, we really want you to shot blast the floor and then, or scarify the floor or grind the floor and then go ahead and put the primer down and pour the leveler on top of there. I'm counting on that texture to help me along on the bite and the grab. On the easy ones, we don't, we're not doing that. Well, you can go ahead and use primer T, um, you can use Echo Prim Grip, you can use Primer X. These are all great options for primers that you just put them on. Mrs. Smith's not going to let you bring in a shop blaster into the middle of her 217 foot living room so you can go ahead and fix the belly and the floor that's in there. So these products are probably the products that you need for that. The next product I'm going to talk about is one of my all time favorites. It is Ultra Plan. M20 Plus. This product is a rock star. It has been around forever. 5,000 PSI's. It's stronger than the sidewalk that's out front of your house, or the house that you're putting in the floor. This is a rock star product. I want to introduce you now to the newer products. The next level of levelers, oh, look at that. The next level of levelers is a little more specific to an application or to a situation. So to start with, we're going to talk about Novo Plan HFL, high flow. So Novo, it's normal setting, and it's got high flow properties. And what that means is, man, this stuff just moves quickly. It spreads out easy. It's very easy to move along a floor. Um, you, there's a lot less manual work done with this product than some of the other products. Next one after that is Novo Plan DPL. DPL stands for deep pour. I can go up to four inches with this product. That's a deep pour. I, without it cracking, breaking, pulling away. Remember, you really need to pay attention to how deep these products can go, and that's also going to determine what product you select. Next one is Novo Plan SP. SP stands for standard performance. This is just a base grade product. I just need to get in here and put a cap on the floor. Um, I, I, I just, I don't need anything too sophisticated or too fancy. Ultra Plan Light is the next product in the lineup. It is just that. It's, we substitute some of the sand out of Ultra Plan and we replace it with a lightweight aggregate. And this is great for older buildings, buildings that are on floor systems that maybe have some flexibility built into them. Ultra Plan LSCs, liquid skim coat. It just flows across that floor. And you can use a you can use the stand-up gauge rake and smoother, or I can drop down on my hands and knees and I can literally skim it with a trowel. And the last product in the lineup is Ultra Plan Extreme 2 interior exterior grade product. This is a product where again if I have a high moisture scenario or I'm on a building they don't have the doors and windows in yet and the temperatures are within the range of the product 50 to 90 degrees I can put this product in. All those other products I needed the HVA system on. I needed the air conditioner or the heating system on. I need to maintain those temperatures this product right here, not so much. I can do this without that. Now, I'm not saying it can get wet. That's not what I'm saying. But if you're a little bit ahead or if they're a little bit behind, you can put this product in. You're not going to impact the performance of this product. By the way, just as a side note, you don't ever want to put self-leveler outside on top of a cement substrate because it's going to lay, it's going to level off and be flat. You always want water moving away from the building or away from a structure. You always want water moving away, not towards a building. Um, having it flat doesn't do that. All right, let's talk about pouring self-leveler. The primer has dried. This is a water pitcher. This comes with our leveling kits. This is a pre-measured marks on there. This will guarantee that you put the proper amount of water when you mix your leveling. You really should look into investing in one of these. You can also go to your local hardware store and get a mixing bucket or a mixing picture that has the markings on there too for, for the proper measurements. 
This is Brian. Brian's going to help me out here, and we're going to pour some leveler. Brian, if you would please, go on up there and grab that leveler. What you can see over in the corner here is a gauge rate, a smoother, and a porcupine roller. The three devices that help you, and you don't have to use all three. Go ahead, Brian. So what you were looking for with self-leveler is you're looking for it flowing across the floor. This is where the primer comes in. The primer blocks the pores and allows it to fly ac slide across the floor and the leveler bonds to the primer. The primer is bonded to the substrate. This is an important package. You want to make sure you understand and use the proper primer for your substrate and then go ahead and put the appropriate leveler down, if you would please. Good. Now, I'm going to walk over here. This is the gauge rake. The gauge rake is adjusted right here to control the amount of product that you put down. Then all you're doing is you're pushing product forward. You always want to pour new product into product that was already poured. So if we're doing this whole floor, for instance, I would pour the next bucket of product into this one, into a wet product, and then go ahead and push the new product into the old and grab the old and pull it back into the new product. It helps blend them together and helps move the product around. Self-levelers can go anywhere between a quarter of an inch all the way up to two inches. We really like two inch leveler pours. Just kidding. This is a smoother. Smoother is very important also for smoothing the floor. It breaks the surface tension, pushes down what's on top, and rotates around what's underneath there, making a nice pretty floor. Now this other device that you have over here, this is a porcupine roller. And uh, this is a really cool thing. What it does is it pokes the holes in there and allows the air to pop out. Air is the kiss of death for levelers, by the way. I also like the porcupine roller because if you didn't get it mixed up or there was a chunk of something in there, it actually picks it up for you and gets it out of there. But it really does blend it nicely. Now you don't need to use all three in combination. You can just use the porcupine roller. You can use the gauge rake and the smoother. It really is up to you. Again, pick that phone up, call your sales rep, talk to your tech rep with, along with the sales rep, and they'll guide you in the proper way to go ahead and do this. Wow. Well, I know that's a lot. Make sure you pick that phone up, find out, call your local sales rep, call your distributor if you have any questions at all, or look us up online at www.mopay.com and check out our websites. Um, send in your questions. If you have any questions, now's the time.